Welcome everybody to Samudra Shakti Online. Glad you're here. So Samudra Shakti Online originated out of a live event that happened in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains in the fall of 2019. And we had an amazing few days together. It was full of Shakti. And what, who you're seeing right now is the planning committee for that event out west. And then after it was over, we just knew we had to keep this energy up, the Shakti up. So we came up with Samudra Shakti Online. Tonight, we have Christine, who is from Australia. And you'll hear it in her voice as soon as, soon as she begins talking. Christine has been studying yoga for quite a long while. In fact, she began studying um, in 1988, first in the Iyengar tradition. And then in 2001, she began studying in the Anasara system. And she had studied Western philosophy at university in her youth and found it intellectually stimulating. Then she began to discover and refine her potent gifts in the tantras and realized that Hatha yoga um, is what she'd been practicing for years and it had its roots in classical tantra. And she was inspired to dive into both the tantric texts and the wider textual sources of yoga. Her first teacher was a Hindu priest who for almost two years taught a weekly class on a wide range of texts on yoga and Indian traditions. Again, it was intellectually stimulating and she really loved the classes and learned a lot. Later, she began attending a local ashram for weekly satsang and various workshops and retreats. She began to realize that the wisdom of the text had a specific purpose to offer a path to transform her life and the way she was to live it, and for her to recognize the truth of her existence. She then met her teacher, Carlos Pameda, in 2005, and she knew she had met her Maha teacher. His wise and generous and compassionate teaching has illuminated hers and stimulated her appetite for home study and practice and has given her the tools and direction to impart the wisdom of these texts to others. She was honored with the Anasara certification in 2009. As well, she continues to teach classes locally and online and to train teachers and conduct immersion programs, as well as offerings and workshops and retreats. She holds a postgraduate diploma in professional art studies and continues to work as a painter and sculptor. I'm going to leave it there because Christine has a very diverse background and I would like to just hand this off to her and let her begin her presentation. Christine, welcome. Thank you. And um, hello, everyone. Hello, Justine. I haven't, uh, didn't see that you popped up there. <laughs> So at the outset, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge that a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is actually um, comes in large part from the teachings of Carlos Pameda. Um, and as Lisa said, he's been my teacher for a long time and continues to be my teacher. And I thought today maybe I would just um, talk some about uh, language and how language uh, really uh, is foundational to, to our practices. Because we create our world through stories or, or narratives about ourselves, about other people, and about things that happen to us and, and things that happen to other people. So there's a saying that the world is as you see it. And this refers to how our narratives shape and also color the experiences we have. And it happens through language. So we create our world through language. Now, this is not just the spoken language, but the language of thoughts and memories as well. And actually the modern perspective is very similar to, the, to this yogic perspective. We've accumulated memories uh, in the subconscious. This is how uh, psychology talks about it. And we process these experiences on the basis of our past. Therefore, we are constructing our reality. But some of us want stories about how things really are. We have a deep-seated need to know about the nature of reality. And I think this is what propels many of us into 
into these studies of the uh, philosophy that uh, underpins yoga. Um, we want to know what the truth really is. So what is the truth? Well, through the ages, um, humanity has been given lots and lots of stories about the nature of reality. Wars have been fought over these stories. Um, Chris Wallace calls them meta-narratives. I really like that term because they're such huge narratives. And um, whole cultures have been decimated over these meta-narratives. So which of these stories is the truth? How do we know it's the truth? So in the Anasara yoga practice, um, our asana practice is informed by Shaiva Tantra. And John Friend used to call it or refer to it as Shiva Shakti Tantra. Um, even though Shiva consciousness and Shakti, the power of consciousness, um, are actually one, not two. They're not two separate uh, entities, they're, they're one. But the names refer to two interdependent aspects of reality as is understood by Tantra. Um, so the divine universal consciousness, which is the one truth in the Tantric understanding, uh, is both the transcendent source of all things meaning that it's not subject to the limitations of things like gravity and space and time. And at the same time, it's completely imminent as all things, meaning that it pervades, permanently pervades uh, the physical material world, all creatures and us, all of us. So what I've loved uh, uh, with the study of uh, Anasara Yoga over the years is that our practices relate to both of these two interdependent aspects of reality. So we can turn within, we can open to grace, we can soften inside, surrender our sense of doership, and we can express what we understand as the truth through our bodies and in relationship to everything else in this world. And we can do that dynamically, creatively, and joyfully. And we do this in our practice and hopefully in our lives out there in general by embracing an uplifting interpretation of reality through the language that we use. Language that's both spoken and thought. Now this is not to be better behaved people or nicer people. Because yoga is not about self-improvement and Carlos is very clear on this but I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Instead um, what Shaiva Tantra does is affirm that using language in an uplifting way is a step towards an experience of the truth but it's still simply a step in the right direction and the memories of meditation for example so um, Michelle was talking about um, the things that come up for, for her in meditation before. They tend to be good memories, but it's still about language. So how is our, how is our um, language involved then in our quest for the truth? So these tantras, the tantras are actually the sacred texts that we, we study. They're, of course, they're based in language. And several of them, um, were clearly written by authors uh, who were fully liberated and awakened spiritual masters. So those texts are going to give us the most direct insight uh, that we can hope to have into the nature of reality that is possible through words because they've experienced this, uh, this truth. And of course, we've got great teachers too. But we need to be aware that the teachings um, are primarily from the outside in. Although if we're fortunate enough to have a guru who's a true guru, then the teachings are from the inside out. But yoga itself is from the inside out. So what is liberation, this experience of the truth? Well, actually, it's not different from the self, big S self, 
that is already who we are. So there's actually nothing to get. What our practices lead us towards is the realization that our current view of reality is actually incomplete. And in that incompleteness, we see our world and all things in it as outside of ourselves. And we make, and, and I think often we uh, mistake behavior for awareness. Awareness being that changeless nature of consciousness. <coughs> Excuse me. We see difference where there's only oneness, and then we explain, we, we describe that difference. Oh, well, she's been doing that that way, and but I always do it this way, and and we do this all the time. We we talk about the difference, um, and um, instead of um, I guess uh, attempting it through our practices to see uh, the oneness. And the other thing is that we're ruled by desire, which is an impulse of our being towards particular types of experiences. But universal consciousness, which in this case I'm describing as the truth, um, is non-verbal, it's non-conceptual, it's quite simply an experience that can't be described. And no matter how hard some people have just tried to describe it, it's still beyond language. So let's go just for a sec, because I'm betting that you've all had glimpses of this truth, maybe just for a second or maybe a nanosecond before language kicked in again. So it might have been uh, something in nature, for example, that you, uh, you were uh, looking at something and suddenly language just wasn't there anymore, but then you start to describe or you respond in some way, oh, oh wow, that's so beautiful. And then the language comes in again and bam, the experience is gone. Has anyone ever had uh, any experience like that? Just unmute yourself and, because I'm, I'm betting that all of you have had some sort of experience like that some experience of great beauty, great joy, great love that can't simply be, that wasn't explained at the time until you tried to explain it. Anyone yeah, had, had a, a connection? Um, like an inexplicable, inexplicable feeling of, um, of connection and love. And then as soon as I like am aware of that, then I've, I've lost it, like it left. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it goes pretty quickly doesn't it <laughs> yeah and then what i find is i'm, I'm i there's a longing for it again <laughs> you know so there's that memory of it and was it real like there was that real right um what i felt i don't uh, yeah so and then i'm i'm not something I'm looking for it, but I'm definitely curious about it. And every so often I remember it and I remember that, but I can't describe that. Yes. And when you, uh, and has anyone noticed that when you do try to describe these experiences, you can't describe them? <laughs> because you can say, oh, it was incredibly beautiful or it was incredibly loving or it was incredibly joyful. And then someone, relates to that in terms of this joy, love and beauty that we explain through language all the time, but we can't explain it through language. It's more than that. It's, more, it's yeah, and Justine's saying for, for sure, words fail the feeling. Yeah. So the other thing is, of course, that we need, unless anyone else wanted to share something there, no? Okay. So we need language. We need it to understand our world and to make sense of it. The problem arises when language is used in a way that creates emotional responses that we can't let go of. And these are referred to as our conditioning or our karma. 
They're often called samskaras, which means memories, but it's actually the vasana, literally meaning perfume, the emotional colouring that the memories have that create our karma, our conditioning. It's actually not the factual nature of the memory itself, because we, we need memory. If we didn't have memory, then I'd be going, well, who am I? What's my name again? Who's my family? Where am I living? You know, we need memory. But it's these emotional overlays that we can't let go of that actually creates the conditioning of the karma. And just a point that um, <clears throat> these two Sanskrit words, samskara and vasana, are often used interchangeably. So sometimes when someone's talking about samskaras, they're actually talking about that emotional overlay or on the memory itself. So if these emotional responses stay with us, so we can't let them go as we experience them, what happens is they become lodged in our subtle body. So that so the subtle body is that uh, part of us, which is the movement of prana or the life force along pathways that we can't see in the body. They're called the, the nadis. You might've come across that term before. So karma is actually the internal mechanism of conditioning and our conditioning is created through language. So I just want to read you a quote from Carlos. He says, karma is the mechanism that drives our evolution. It is based on the conditioning power of words and the emotional overlay on them. And then I just want to be really clear about this because this is something that's bandied about a lot. Karma is not a retribution mechanism. It's not something, you know, oh, I've been a naughty girl, the universe is going to get me back. It's absolutely nothing like that. That's a nonsense. Karma is simply our conditioning that's created through our emotional responses that we can't let go of. So what karma does actually is it obscures our experience of the truth. So whatever we practice has to um, help with the conditioning if we want to experience the truth. And yoga, hooray! Yoga is the response to the conditioning. Yay! <laughs> so if we eliminate that conditioning that keeps us bound to a limited viewpoint, we can see things as they really are. And I'm assured that we can do that it's possible to be in that state, in this body, in this lifetime. This is what Carlos assures us over and over again. But just as there's a, a force that connects us to our body, and that's that, that pranic life force, the force of karma keeps our perceptions, our senses moving or turning outwards as we keep um, seeking certain types of experience. So what's the solution? Well, there's a lot more I could say about karma, uh, thanks to Carlos's courses, but there's no time today. What I can offer briefly are uh, a few practical suggestions. So first of all, if in our daily activities, we are mindful, cultivating attention as we are barraged by distractions, well, that's me, I don't know if that's you, but. I certainly am. Then, <clears throat> and if we, uh, and, and by being mindful, by cultivating attention, then we're developing an expanded awareness, then conditioning is less likely to take us over. And then if we uh, develop the awareness that everything is transitory and the only constant is consciousness itself, then we are less likely to be bound by our conditioning. So this, I really love this quote, um, this too shall pass. And then this is an interesting one, I think. Um, if we, we can create good intentions for our actions, because a good intention is actually more important than the action itself. A good intention is more important than the action itself. So think about how often you've had a really good intention for something 
and then you act and the action doesn't correspond with your good intention because of maybe other things that come in to, to um, counteract the action or, or change it in some way, but it's still that good intention that is the powerful thing. So the other thing that um, I want to say too is that a healthy action is not actually a moral action. A healthy action is simply one that doesn't create suffering for yourself or for others. And then our Hatha Yoga practice. Um, so that's number four. So when we practice, uh, when we practice attention and develop and expand awareness in our practice, the prana that's moving through the nadis is a force that clears the structure that karma produces. Now, this idea of a structure that karma produces, Carlos says that that the the karmic conditioning conditioning exists as tiny little crystalline structures along the nadis. And then as a force of prana, like a great river moving through the, through the nadis, it actually clears those little structures out. I love that. <laughs> so, so that, that is, you know, so our alignment principles are so important here because when we bring our awareness to our alignment and let that flow of prana move clearly through the body, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I think it's so neat. And then number five, we can hold our center. Staying quiet within, even as we act in a physically strong way or even in an emotionally strong way. And I have seen some um, great beings um, get angry at something that, that they didn't want happening. But at the same time, they were completely calm. And at the end of what they said, it was like nothing had ever happened. <laughs> That's really holding your center, <laughs> even when things happen in an emotionally strong way. And then in our meditation practice, it is cleansing because everything that comes up is our system trying to heal. When memories come up in meditation, our system is trying to dissolve them. But here's the thing. If we, great, if we engage with them, if we follow the story that, of the things that come up in meditation, what we're doing is reinforcing the emotional content. Who's ever done that? I think we've all done that. <laughs> I do it quite a lot. And then I go, oh, where's the story taken me? Come back. Come back to my center. And here's, a, I, I love this too. Carlos said this in the, in the, um, in the course he did on uh, Karma and the Journey of the Soul. Our dreams are unloading vasanas. I think that's great news. <laughs> Our dreams are unloading vasanas. So things that come up in your dreams, again, our system is trying to heal. And in dreams, well, I've never managed to actually um, control the dream. I know that some people have been able to do that. I can't. But I just really like the fact that I'm unloading this emotional content. So just one last thing before we uh, move on. Just as we practice Shavasana at the end of a Hatha Yoga practice, relishing the state of awareness that we've created, why not do the same at the end of a meditation practice? So without rushing off, just relish the state of awareness of meditation, even if you don't think it was a good meditation. I had a meditation this morning where all I was thinking of was this presentation. Pretty much. My whole meditation <laughs> was just bombarded with what's going to happen in this presentation for me. So, um, <clears throat> so, so I, I came out of that, well, maybe it wasn't a good meditation, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Maybe I was unloading some vasanas about, you know, my, um, my nervousness around presenting like this. So, and remember, it's, it's only through experience that the truth is revealed. Everything else 
is a story, it's a narrative. And it's through our practices that we can come closer to the, to the experience. So any, any comments about that? I've been rabbiting on a bit. Any comments? Anyone want to make any comments about that? And then I'll just go on to, because the second part of my talk was a few misunderstandings. So I'll um, get on to that. If you want to make a comment. Yeah, Christine, in the chat, um, Lisa put a question in the chat. And the question is about karma. Is karma kind of like ego? Would you like to respond to that? Uh, Sure. Um, ego is actually part of the mind. So in the yoga, uh, in the tantric understanding, the mind has three parts. It has the ego. It has, so we've got manas, which is the part of the mind that um, draws the sensory information in. We've got ahamkara, which is, the, um, which is the ego. And it's the ego that makes sense of who we are, who we are in this world. And then we've got the buddhi, which is that deeper layer of the mind, which is our, um, uh, our intuition. It's, it's our discernment, actually. The buddhi is the way we discern things. So it is the buddhi, actually, that gets cleared of the karma. We've got to have ego. We have to have ego to live in this world. Sometimes the ego becomes dominant. And so we think that we need to do everything from the ego and we forget about the, the, the what I love in the Anasara practice is that um, uh, idea of that we are co-creating when we, when we do anything. Because remember, Shakti is the, is the power of consciousness. She's the creator of everything. As individual, limited individuals, uh, with our own egos and individual sense of ourselves, we are co-creating with Shakti. But if the ego becomes dominant, then we, we think that we're doing everything. So we forget that truth that lies within us. And um, so we, we act just from the ego. But it is actually the buddhi, that discernment layer of the mind, which is often uh, referred to as... Um, when we clean the mirror of the buddhi, what we're doing is, so here's my cloth cleaning the mirror of the buddhi. We're cleaning away those uh, emotional, um, that conditioning that's created through those, through the emotional overlays of our memories. So our discernment then, and I, I don't know if you've noticed this, if you've been practicing for a long time, that your discernment actually does become clearer it becomes more discerning. Does anyone ever notice that? Yeah? Maybe not admitting to it. <laughs> yeah, says Lisa. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, we, and then it's like, what am I really discerning? You know, you know the, I exactly. got a rabbit because, hole on that one. <laughs> yeah, because the conditioning is still operating within the within the buddhi. So, um, so yeah, the ego is part of this threefold nature of the mind. Um, we have to have ego, otherwise I wouldn't remember who I was. Uh, my name's Christine, and um, I live in Buladila. So, um, if there's no other comments, I'll just get on to something about. Um, these misunderstandings, maybe just cover uh, a couple of them. And the first one I'd like to draw your attention to is that around the yamas and the niyamas of Pat uh, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which is the new name that's been given to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. I often hear people call them the sutras, uh, but we've, we've got to remember that there's actually hundreds of sutras, and Patanjali's is just one of them, albeit it's, a, it's an important one but it's just one of them. So Patanjali Yoga Shastra, then Shastra means authoritative commentary. And because of recent exhaustive research by this Austrian scholar called Philip Maas, M-A-A-S, we now know that the Vyasa, um, who wrote the commentary on this text, was actually Patanjali himself. 
So um, the word Vyasa means arranger. So the compiler and the commentator are one and the same person. And then we've also got a date, uh, a, a clearer date uh, for the compilation of the sutras, and that is between 325 and 425 CE. So this concept of karma that I described earlier is actually the basis for all of the practices in Patanjali's text. He uses meditation as a technique to experience liberation. And this, um, uh, this technique uses, um, so the meditation um, entailing the complete eradication of karma uses the mind to clear the mind of karmic imprints or conditioning. So mind is an expression of prana. So it's like experience crystallized. Mind is an expression of prana. It is prana. So Patanjali is using meditation as a technique to clear the mind of its karmic imprints and he uses the mind. In contrast, Hatha Yoga uses the flow of prana through the nadis to clear the conditioning. So this is, this is really the, a main difference between Patanjali using the mind and Hatha Yoga using the breath and the body. So as in the, um, in the tantras, the sacred texts, Patanjali's teachings start with the highest and that's in the first chapter. And if we don't get it immediately, if we're not liberated straight away, if that doesn't work, we're invited to start lower. And the yamas and the niyamas are in the outermost circle of the teachings. But they're not about ethics and morals. Now they're often taught as ethics and morals in yoga. But Patanjali says of the yamas and niyamas, he says, future suffering should be avoided. He never makes a moral or ethical argument. In fact, the whole text of the of Patanjali Sutras is practical. Free yourself from the bondage of suffering, and that bondage is conditioning. So ethics as a practice, and I think we really need to remember this in our teaching too, is that ethics as a practice only has meaning in society. Yoga is not about, I'm talking louder because the rain on my tin roof is getting really loud, sorry. <laughs> Yoga is not about improving our false nature. We practice to reveal our true nature. So the yamas and the niyamas aren't like the Ten Commandments. The whole work of spirituality is not about behavior. Although I have to say that it is much easier to change behavior than it is to remember to bring awareness to everything that we do. And that awareness that we bring brings us deeper into ourselves. But if we're just changing our behavior, we're just changing our false nature. This is in the tantric understanding. That's all we're doing, we're just, you know, shifting our false nature around a bit. That's not to say that behavior isn't important in society because it most definitely is. And you might want to improve the way you behave, but it's not important in yoga. And I just want to uh, read you something from Chogyam Trungpa. Anyone ever read Chogyam Trungpa, the great Buddhist teacher? No. Anyway, I'll just read you this. He's got a book called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, which is a fabulous book. And he says, when we formulate a secondary judgment, like I should be doing this and should avoid doing that, then we have achieved a level of complication which takes us a long way from the basic simplicity of what we are. I'll say it again. Yoga is from the inside out, not the outside in. And if you've been practicing for a while, you might have noticed, 
Becky, no, I'm not watering my plants. The rain is watering my property. <laughs> so if you've been practicing for a while or even for a short time, you might have noticed that even though you don't practice deliberately the yamas and niyamas or Ten Commandments or any other sort of, you know, structures like that, you actually become more ethical. It just happens naturally because of the yoga that you practice, releasing the conditioning that keeps you bound, we become more ethical. It's a natural process from just doing yoga. So actually, Tantra dropped the yamas and the niyamas. So uh, that might tell you something about um, the importance that Tantra um, ascribed to um, to those, but I did look at um, Georg Fürstein's great big book on. Um, I haven't got it with me here. Great big compendium on on yoga, and he actually describes the, them there as the ethical underpinnings of yoga. But um, Carlos is very, very, very firm on this: <laughs> that ethics doesn't belong in the yoga practice. It belongs in society, but not in the yoga practice. So one other point about the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, the word asana in, in chapter 2, verse 46, which reads, Shtira Sukha Asanam, the pose should be steady and comfortable. Now this sutra is not about Hatha Yoga, it's about meditation. Nor is the asana of the eight limbs about Hatha Yoga. So as or asa means to sit, and the ana ending is like our ing in English. Therefore, it means sitting. And in Australia, when we, when you know, if I teach us meaning to sit, and everyone understands what I mean. <laughs> Sorry, that's an Australian joke that maybe no one else gets. So sitting comfortably and steadily, so the mind isn't disturbed or distracted by fidgeting or discomfort. But actually, this sutra is supposed to be read in conjunction with the following sutra, which is about how you make the posture steady and comfortable, and that is by relaxing your effort and contemplating the infinite. And I want to ask you this question too. Have you ever noticed yourself in meditation that it's only when you go deeper, so I might be sitting in meditation and going, oh, God, my knee hurts. Oh, I've got this pain on in my inner knee. And then I go, okay, take my mantra into the heart space, whatever technique I'm using. And I go deeper and deeper and suddenly my knee doesn't exist anymore. So when we go deeper, these outer discomforts actually melt away. And when you're drawn back to the outer world, they come back. Oh, my knee's hurting again. So... To come back to that first point, and I'm going to finish in a couple of minutes, the eight limbs of Patanjali Sutras are not about Hatha Yoga. They're about how we use the mind, mind right through the body, so that we don't accrue more karma and can let go of the karma we already have. His teaching concerns the mind, not the body. Actually, he says of the body that he finds it I just had a look at this um, sutra here. Very distasteful. The body is very distasteful. Now, in our Anasara practice, do we say that the body is very distasteful? No, we say it's divine. <laughs> so why are we using, you know, Patanjali's? If you've ever tried one of Patanjali's meditations, I actually find them really difficult. I'd much prefer the meditations that, uh, that involve my imagination and, um, and the techniques of just spaciousness and mantra, all of those things. Does anyone have any questions about the things that I've piled on you? <laughs> Christine, this is um, Deb Payne, and I'm sorry, I hope I didn't step on anybody because I can't see, I'm on the phone. Um, you're right. Thank, 
Thank you so much. I never get uh, tired of these discussions of philosophy and, and every time something new comes through or, or reminds me of something I've forgotten or had kind of gotten the lost in the shadows. Um, and I thank you for bringing up booty and discernment. That's one of my favorite topics, I think, or one of my favorite aspects of our practice and, and aspects of life. Um, and there's so much to think about here and so many seeds planted, so much more. I hope that we get another opportunity um, with you for you to share more of this with us. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Deb. Thank you, yeah. Well, you and me both fascinated by the whole thing. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I'll try and answer them. I just wanted to comment. I love how you talk about how language is so important, but how we have that, there's that difficulty of translating from experience into language. But I think it's important like for us to be able to share and discuss this and try to come to a mutual understanding. Somehow we have to come from experience to, a, to a, um, a shared language of these experiences. And it's so, it's just like uh, Lisa said, it's a rabbit hole to go down these different uh, topics every time. I think I took six or eight pages of notes, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw a few people were writing, <laughs> but um, yeah. no, that's great, yes. Um, you know what I, what I really love about the Anasara practice is the way that we use language. So, for example, if someone wanted to teach the uh, yamas or niyamas, um, in the niyamas, for example, um, or let's say, no, in the yamas, asteya, non-stealing. I have heard uh, people say they're going to teach non-stealing in but then, you know, just that language of steel, it's going to be a trigger for some people. And it's not going to be a great trigger for some people. So if we can simply change that language and say something like, express the fullness of who you truly are, or something like that, that, that if we come into something that is already full, already uh, uh, part of that, um, language that we try to describe consciousness or the divine then we're moving people away from their triggers and i think that's really important in the teaching um, aspect of things that we don't trigger people we don't bring up um, emotions that are going to uh, then uh, either develop into seeds or or then reinforce seeds that already exist in our conditioning I think one of the big um, confusions, especially when you first begin, or for me, uh, I guess I can only speak from my experience, when I first began my studies in Anasara is there's oftentimes this hybridization between, you know, more of a classical viewpoint and then what is Tantra, you know, and, and your point yeah. about the Yamas and Niyamas is very important. It's a huge distinction. Uh, for us, as well as the sutras and how the sutras are translated. Yeah. Yeah. And I, even, you know, I spent my first years, 10 years actually, as an Iyengar teacher, did Iyengar teach training. And nothing was, uh, the only philosophy that was ever talked about was uh, Patanjali, but it wasn't actually taught. And in fact, BKS Iyengar has this hybridization of Tantra, or had this hybridization of Tantra and Patanjali, but never made a point of distinguishing between. In fact, he makes this comment, he's made this comment at one point, um, my body is my temple, the asanas are my prayers. Now that is, that's Tantra. That's not a distasteful body. <laughs> but that's a tantric understanding of, of what our body is. It's a, it's a temple. But then he goes on and just uses the mind to 
you know, in the, so it is this, and, and because I anger, the rain's getting really heavy now, so I'm leaning in close. So, so because um, the early uh, yoga teachings were very much around the Iyengar uh, practices, then I think this hybridization has become entrenched. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this talk is to start digging the trench out a bit and to start separating these two practices because they are so, tell us as they universes apart. And that, you know, if, we, if we're going to continue uh, pulling Patanjali into, into our tantric practices, we're confusing people. I think that's what we're doing. It's just confusing people. I would have to agree that I felt that way early on when I did not, I was not distinguishing. And it took sitting with several scholars, also having um, more senior teachers kind of explain to me, this was, this was like revolutionary when, I, when, it, when it was explained to me, like, look, you've got to look at it as a timeline of people having conversations about what this is. And so you're, you're diving like back, you know, this many thousands of years into the conversation, then you're jumping forward you know, another couple hundred years as people are discussing the ideas of what it means to be alive, you know, what this existence is, the true nature of who we are. And in addition to that, you have all these scholars commenting on what somebody else said, however many centuries ago. So for me, all of this was initially, and still is, can be incredibly overwhelming, you know, like, like where do I dive in and yep. what is it, what do I study? to bring my practice further along. And so do you have a, we have like about a minute left. If, you know, if it's for somebody who's like, who is feeling a little bit like I have felt like, ah, you know, yeah, at least the other Lisa here in the room is waving her hand like, I feel the same way. All right, so, you know, what's a quick way to say, here's where, here's a good spot to dive in here. If you wanna uh, study more from a tantric perspective. And I know you're gonna say study with Carlos, and to you know, sign up for these online trainings coming up this fall. Yes, and you know, what text? What you know, specifically? Any any recommendation there, Christine? Well, I use I use Christopher Harish Wallace's text on tantra. Um, I think it's a really good overview. Um, some of the other texts on tantra. Yes, there, Michelle has it. Tantra illuminated. Yeah. Yeah, thank it's you. It's a very good book. Yeah. And he also has some really good blog posts uh, on various subjects. I was going to cover the chakras today. Have a look at his uh, blog post on chakras um, because the chakras is another one that's moved way away from its original source. Way, like over the other side of the world from its original source. And... Um, so, uh, yeah, just to, just to, I guess, cut th through to the chase, if you like, on, on what Tantra is, how it differs from classical yoga, for example, how it differs from Advaita Vedanta, and how it differs from some of the other, um, uh, and also to understand, I guess, too, that, you know, we come out of Shaivism, uh, Vaishnavism is, is the other main tradition through yoga history. You know, it's, it's a huge subject, enormous subject. But if you can just get into it uh, a little bit and understand where we're coming from in a, in a sarah practice, I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining us tonight and from around the world on Samudra Shakti Online. And we'll see you next month. Christine, many thanks.